Hey everyone, it's Nick at Great Lakes Comic Con 2024. I'm here with Rick Goldschmidt, who is the historian and biographer of the Rankin Bass Animation Company that we all know, most of us know from the classic Christmas specials, but they have a lot more on their resume than that. So Rick, let me first start with your connection to Rankin Bass. How did you become involved and how did you get to this point? Well, I um, right out of college, uh, my degree was in art illustration and I became good friends with Jack Davis yep. and Paul Coker Jr. right out of Mad Magazine. And uh, I knew Jack had designed Mad Monster Party for Rankin Bass, which was always one of my favorite projects. And I said, whatever happened to Arthur Rankin and Jules Bass? You never hear anything about him. Never re I never read anything about him. And he said, oh, I'm still doing work for Arthur. You should uh, give Paul Coker a call get and I did and Paul gave me Arthur's phone number in Bermuda and I called him up and I said you know there really should be a book and he said send me two chapters so I went and made up two chapters and I sent it to him and he liked it and a package came with a little micro cassette with his life story on his business you know how he got into doing Rankin Bass so I worked on my first book, The Enchanted World of Rankin Bass, for about seven years. And when it finally came out in 97, he came over to my home to make sure I was all legit. And he liked what he saw. And uh, I just became sort of the, the holder of all the Rankin Bass archives. So all the photographs, all the artwork, everything. I have in my possession and and I worked with all of the great people and we're talking about Don Duga, Maury Laws, Jules Bass, you know, all the people that worked on the specials and they all were great people and, and opened up their archives to me. So that's where I got into it. Okay, um, well, as I, I mentioned, some of the Christmas specials. Now, Rankin Bass, a lot of people know them for the stop motion. Is that stop motion actually the correct term for what yeah, they did? It was Animagic. It was all done in Japan, one frame at a time with small dolls. They kind of were about this size for Rudolph, and uh, they would just manipulate their joints and make them move on screen, which is kind of tedious. I could never be a stop motion animator, but um, the Japanese were experts, and Arthur loved the culture there, so he oversaw it. Jules never went to Japan. It was just Arthur who went to Japan. He loved the culture. He loved the people, and that's how they got their Animagic done. Interesting. So give us a quick story of their studio how did what, what did they start with and how did they progress and, and how did they be, find that niche of holiday movies because they also did the easter bunnies coming to town and right. rudolph's new year etc right well everything came out of new york first of all arthur had residents that he turned half of it into business addresses in the early days so all of the people, like I mentioned, Jack Davis, Paul Coker, they were all living in New York at the time. So they would get the artists and Maury Laws to do the music, and everything was done in the States. Then they went to Canada initially for the voice work. Paul Souls, Billy Mae Richards, all the people that we know. All the, Larry Mann, who was a, a Canadian who came to the States, and was in all the television shows of uh, our past. He became an actor in the U.S. So Canada was big for the voice acting segment, and then they worked with the musicians in England. Maury Laws went to England to live and did all his orchestrations there. Initially, they were known as Videocraft International, and that was because they were an international company. They got into the Christmas stuff because of Rudolph, solely because of Rudolph. They thought Return to Oz, which was the first special they did for the General Electric Fantasy Hour, would be a much bigger deal than Rudolph. But Rudolph turned out to be the big hit, and then everybody wanted a Christmas special from them. 
and eventually they did the little drummer boy and Frosty and Santa Claus is coming to town. Nestor the long-eared donkey. Right, right. And the animation actually got a little bit more, uh, better as it went along, but I like the earlier designs by Tony Peters best. Uh, Rudolph, Willie McBean and his magic machine. Um, some of the early stuff is really what drew me into Rankin Bass. Sure. Um, you, you know, Rudolph and Frosty, for example, were based on existing songs. Right. And so the story came from the... So how did they pick those particular songs? Well, um, Johnny Marks was a, a neighbor of Arthur Rankin's, so that's why Rudolph was the first. But Romeo Muller, who was the writer, created all of the other characters. So with the storybook that was in at Montgomery Awards by Robert L. May, that just focused on Rudolph and Santa. Romeo brought in the Island of Misfit Toys, Hermie the Dentist, all of the Yukon Cornelius. So Romeo Muller played a huge role in taking the song, like from Frosty, Santa Claus is Coming to Town, and developing it with a whole bunch of other characters that, especially the Heat Miser and Snow Miser are so popular. Um, he really was responsible for creating most of it. The, the music that he did is an embarrassment of riches. The, put one foot in front of the other. Almost every song in Santa Claus is Coming to Town is a classic in its own right. Not that the rest of the specials didn't have great music, but I mean, it's, it's and I watch these every year to this day. I have the bo DVD box sets, and I'm just blown away by how good the music is. Well, Maury Laws was a very close friend of mine. I'm a musician also. I've recorded music with the Jim Blossoms, and I know about recording techniques and mastering and all of that. And Maury lived in Appleton, Wisconsin, and his son lived in downtown Chicago. So whenever he visited his son, I would meet up with him and have dinner. And he really respected that I was a musician and that I knew how important the music was and how it was a, a bigger piece of the puzzle than most people give it credit for. And then Jules Bass wrote the lyrics, which were always great, and they fit into the, the they didn't just stop and do a song. It had to fit the storyline, like put one foot in front of the other and all the others. <laughs> yeah, you know, and, and a lot of those were kind of slightly traumatic. I must say that the most traumatic part of every Christmas is when Santa comes into the greenhouse and Karen is crying over Frosty's, the puddle that was Frosty. Did it ever occur to them when they wrote that, that Karen had to witness the melting of Frosty? Well, it, it was significant, but obviously he came back to life with Santa's help. After we're done pulling the yeah. out, of course. Yeah, and also uh, Baba and the little drummer boy getting hit by the, uh, yeah, Nestor. Well, that came from Bambi. It was sort of a, a Bambi uh, tribute. Um, usually Romeo wrote completely free of any kind of other writing, but that was more of a Bambi writing. <laughs> and uh, another Christmas-themed uh, special. So let's switch gears a little bit over to Tolkien. So how, how did they become involved with The Hobbit? And then, then they did Return of the King, but Ralph Bakshi did Lord of the Rings. So are they connected, and how did they get started in that? Well, um, they got the rights to the book, um, initially, and uh, whoever owned the rights, I was talking to somebody earlier today. I think Tolkien had already passed away, but his estate was working with Arthur and Jules. And at some point in the development of The Hobbit, they said, we don't want you to do this. But it came to, you know, we already bought the rights. We can do it. We're going to do it. And they won a Peabody and a, a, William, or a Christopher Award which is a very prestigious thing in animation to win those awards. So that led not only to Return of the King, but it led to them doing a lot of fantasy art with um, The Last Unicorn, Flight of Dragons. They did a Wind in the Willows, which was very kind of fantasy-like. So it was a totally different uh, style and direction for Rankin Bass, but they, 
they like to try a lot of different things. You know, um, eventually they got into making feature films for uh, like the ABC Friday Night movie, uh, The Bermuda Depths and The Last Dinosaur. And they made a movie called Marco with Desi Arnaz Jr., which was a live action movie. Unfortunately, they never got a really big budget to make the kind of movies Arthur did want to make. But um, they were very experimental at the time they did The Hobbit. And uh, it really uh, it brought in a whole new fan base, too. I, I appeared at Dragon Con in Atlanta, and I did five panels there. And one of them was strictly about the fantasy uh, films. And every panel I did was crowded. It was full. So there's all different kinds of fan bases for the Rankin Bass. How, how was it they didn't do uh, Two Towers and Fellowship of the Ring and that went to Bakshi? Yeah, um, I think some of it became public domain. Some of it couldn't even be aired in Canada either, is what Arthur was telling me. And um, he was very dissatisfied with Return of the King because it combined uh, more than one book, I think. And uh, he thought it was too much. So but their, their Return of the King wasn't necessarily meant to be a direct sequel to Bakshi's. Right. right. And their Return of the King, I learned later from seeing it on YouTube, it first aired as part of the ABC Friday night movie or the Wednesday night movie or something. Aired, yeah. yeah. It wasn't like a, a TV special. Right. The Hobbit was for the Xerox company. So The Hobbit was huge. Everybody wanted to see it because they read the book. Every, all the kids I went to school with were reading the book. So it was like huge to see what they actually look like. And there was a great uh, coffee table book right. that came out at the time. I always wanted it. Um, okay, so lastly, so what's the legacy of Rankin Bass? Are they still as popular as ever? Are, 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 are young people discovering still Rudolph and all these shows? I'm finding that uh, Rankin Bass is an inflation proof uh, business because everybody wants to go back to when times were good for them, their childhood, and just not think about all the, the horrible things that are going on in the world. And there's generation after generation, they show it to their kids and their kids show it to their kids. And Rudolph is 60 this year. And the year without a Santa Claus and Twas the Night Before Christmas, which is another great special, right. are 50 this year. And that's gonna be my seventh book on the year without a Santa Claus and Twas the Night Before Christmas. I love those specials and in, in Night Before Christmas was traditional animation like right. like Frosty. What what made them go back and forth sometimes from stop motion to traditional animation? Well, if they were um, in production with say Santa Claus is coming to town and it takes like a year to do Animagic yeah. or eighteen months in some cases. All they could do if they sold the special to another network, say NBC or CBS, they can only offer it to them and, and sell animation. So they would hire Mushi or Toei in Japan while the animators were working on, say, Nestor or something like that. Okay. Yeah, so they couldn't always do it. Right. Okay. But, but they did want it to look like the Paul Coker artwork, and the only way they could do that is in cell animation. It doesn't really look like his artwork in Animagic. So. What's next for you? Um, my book and uh, a couple more appearances this year. With the 60th uh, of Rudolph, I'll probably, probably be on CBS's na national news. And it gets a lot of attention when it's a big uh, anniversary like that. So it's always fun to celebrate you know what brought you know what really makes the holiday great for me is the traditional um, Rudolph and Santa Claus is coming to town and Frosty they did all the classic Christmas characters I mean Charlie Brown is great um, Mr. Magoo uh, Christmas Carol is great uh, the Grinch is great but they don't have Santa and 
Frosty and reindeer and all the things that we love about Christmas in them, and Rankin Bass does. So where can we get your books? Well, um, at Miser Bros, like the Heat Miser and Snow Miser, miserbros.com, that's M-I-S-E-R-B-R-O-S. Or I have an Etsy shop. I have uh, books in the Amazon Marketplace, and I'm on eBay under Miser Bros, too. Okay. So I always personalize and draw in the books as well. Thanks Thank again. You.